Hi, this is Eric from Longbox Review at longboxreview.wordpress.com. Today I wanted to talk about a few specific comics, and the reason I'm going to do this is because my daughter uh, just turned 21 a few weeks back, and it got me thinking, um, besides how old I'm feeling, um, I was wondering, well, what were the comics that I got uh, when I was 21, and specifically what were the comics that came out in March? Uh, the year that I had turned 21. And uh, so that was in March 1990. And so uh, I'm going to talk about, let's see, uh, Daredevil 280, Legion of Superheroes uh, number 7, um, Hawk and Dove number 12, New Titans number 66, uh, Star Trek number 8, Animal Man 23, and uh, Legion 90 number 15. So uh, let's get to that. So here's Daredevil 280. And this features uh, a story that uh, was by Anne Nassetti, um, and uh, with art by John Romita Jr. on pencils and Al Williamson inks. And so this is where Daredevil meets uh, the, the the devil, quote unquote, of the Marvel Universe, uh, uh, Mephisto, and which was an interesting story. I remember liking it. Uh, let's see, um, this along with um, the. Gosh, what was the, I can't remember, um, Typhoid Mary. I remember this story and the Typhoid Mary story being kind of longish. I might be getting the two stories confused in my head, um, but uh, it was an, uh, an interesting time in Daredevil comics. I, I, I remember enjoying the Anna Seti run on this title. And uh, interestingly enough, considering how I feel about John Romita Jr.'s pencils now in comics, I actually liked his work on this, and I remember liking his work on this, so when I got to reading, um, let's see, what was it, The Avengers that he did uh, several years ago, I got those first six issues that he did with Brian Michael Bendis, um, and he's now on Captain America, uh, I can't stand his art now. I, I, I just don't like it at all. But here, and maybe the difference is, uh, well, one, it could be just his style has evolved. Uh, but but two, and I don't know who inks him now, on, say, on Captain America, but um, uh, maybe Al Williamson contributed to a large part of making this artwork uh, palatable to me. Um, let's see. There's, there's not much going on here um, in the story. There's a lot of supporting characters, a lot of asides, if you will, um, that don't feature Daredevil uh, in this particular issue. Uh, but it does, as I, I'm sure it all works out in the end, uh, all the subplots come together, and I, I hope maybe one of these days I should go back and read it and find out. Uh, I think that's about it I'll have to say about <laughs> that issue of Daredevil. Uh, but this next issue, this is awesome. Uh, Legion of Superheroes number 7, this is the five year later run by Keith Giffen. Uh, Tom and Mary uh, Bearbaum and Al Gordon doing this. This is, this is probably one of my favorite runs of comics of all time. I mean, I love the Legion of Superheroes. I always have, um, but this particular run, just, I don't know, I, maybe just the me being that age, after having read comics for so long, I've been reading comics since I was in the fourth grade, so what is that? That's uh, eight, ten, I don't, I don't know what it is. Um, so, you know, a good, a good 10, 15 years at most, maybe. Um, so, uh, reading this at that age, uh, and having grown up with the Legion, so to speak, and then having the these characters in the five year later run be uh, adults essentially. I mean, they all they, in the later years, but even before the five year later run, um, the Legion kind of had matured enough. You know, they could they were I I would consider them in their at least in their early twenties, uh, if not older, um, depending on the character. But here they're definitely you know the, the earlier stuff is when they were teenagers, and this is when they're in their young adult phase. Um, and, and just works it really well. But this this particular issue, this is two issues in uh, to the storyline where the Time Trapper had been defeated and uh, uh, Mordru had been allowed to come to power. And, and so this happened uh, in issue five. Monel um, beat the crap out of the Time Trapper and erased the Time Trapper's influence on the universe. And, the, and that time stream. And so now we get into the set, like I said, this is the second issue of the, the new world, the, the new status quo, where Mordru is, is, is basically in charge. 
and um, they're also trying to um, I believe this is the issue where they introduce Laurel Gand so this was uh, the Giffen and Bear Bombs attempt at coming up with a Superboy and Supergirl substitute which is where you get Laurel Gand uh, coming into Supergirl and um, but everything else is fairly well intact you, uh, you have um, a run-in with um, Cosmic Boy and um, uh, Mordru, which was really good, uh, leaving uh, Mordru impressed as hell with Rock Kryn, uh, which is always great because Rock has always been one of my favorite Legionnaires. So I, I, I enjoyed the spotlight uh, on that character. Um, it's just it's just really, really good. I don't know if this stuff has been collected in trade, the five year later stuff. Uh, if, if it hasn't been, that's a travesty because it really, really should be. And I highly recommend if you're a Legion fan, if you're a, a Keith Giffen fan, um, you should pick this stuff up. It's, it's such good, good comics. Um, going to an issue that mm, probably isn't such good comics, but, but it was enjoyable anyway. Um, this is Hawk and Dove. There we, there we go. Hawk and Dove number 12 featuring the new Titans. Um, this is a, two, a second part of two parts where the Hawk and Dove team up with the New Titans. Turns out in uh, issue 11's letter column, um, there was a comment made by the, uh, I don't know who wrote it, if it was the editor or the writers. Anyway, they, they talked about how because of such high demand from the fans of Hawk and Dove uh, to team up with the Titans, that's what we got. And so this is the second story, uh, second part of the story. This is just... There's, there's not a whole lot really going on here. They're investigating um, these uh, cyborg robot things. Um, that's pretty much it. They, they just, it's one big, they go after the, the, the bad guys, they fight the bad guys, you know, the formula. Uh, there, is, there is some nice interaction with, uh, especially Dove with the new Titans. She, she shows up here, let me see if I can find a picture and show you real quick but Dove shows up uh, with with the Titans and she's all um, yeah here we go here's 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 a picture looking that over here yeah right there so she's got sunglasses on and she's wearing a coat and, and a hood of some type because she's she's not Dove there she's Don Granger and she's you know trying to keep her identity separate you know she doesn't want to just reveal it to these Titans just because which I thought was a nice, uh, a nice touch, uh, if you will. Uh, but then she comes to know, or comes to know the, the Titans a little bit, and and decides, you know, these are really cool people, and they were. Um, and uh, and then in the in the end, uh, uh, reveals her identity. You know, trust them enough to to let them know. But what what got me about this, as I flipped through it before this review or this look at, was how in the end, you know, they all work together to defeat the bad guy, but then. You know, some offhand comment, uh, uh, Hank Hall, Hawk, just goes off on everybody. And, you know, I'm the best and you guys suck. And, and, you know, so I guess it's a way to keep Hawk and Dove away from the Titans, not to become part of the Titans, I guess. But it just seems, you know, and, and Hank has that personality, he always has. But it always seems to just come up when um, the plot demands it so that people kind of alienate or, or push him away. So he is alienated. From, from the rest of the, the team. And, and, you know, the Titans, of course, are all um, willing to just do that because they can't stand the guy. And, you know, they did, and uh, uh, Donna Troy does ask Don Granger, you know, why do you stick with him? And, and she says, because we have so much in common, because we're exact opposites. Uh, it, that's just, the answer is both. And, and I, always, I always did enjoy um, that relationship between Hank and Don because she did understand him and uh, no one else seemed to. And it was a nice a nice uh, relationship that I wish had gone further because this is a series, you get down the road uh, about a year-ish and they just cancel it because at the last minute uh, during that whole, um, gosh, what was the name of that thing? 2001, Armageddon 2000? I don't remember what it was, uh, but anyway, uh, they made Hank Hall the bad guy, turned him into Monarch when he wasn't supposed to be. That was supposed to be Captain Adam, but um, word got out, and so last-minute decision, they, oh, well, let's just, uh, Hank, he, he's a good choice for this. Um, and then they ended the Hawk and Dove series, which really ticked me off. But, that, but that's a future issue, not this one. 
Uh, going from Hawk and Dove uh, featuring the Titans, well, we get the new Titans, number 66. And this is, um, as you can see, Raven's kissing some dude on here. Uh, this was this was an interesting issue in that the the guy here is named Eric, and you know that's my name. Um, and there aren't too many. So this was the first time that I uh, read in li literature that I would read or even saw in movies or TV really um, a character named Eric, and I thought that was pretty cool. Unfortunately, it turns out that this is a bad guy. He's not such a great uh, love interest for Raven. Um, he's 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 after her life essence or whatever. Um, and and that began a long run of years where whenever a character named Eric would come into a story, and this is not the only Eric that I read in comics, but he turned out to be a bad guy, and it really makes me mad because I'm not bad. <laughs> Uh, I just I hate I hate the the name Eric being besmirched like that. So uh, let's see anything else in here that was interesting. Uh, there you get a little bit of story with Jericho and his relationship with Raven, and they seem to have a nice um, um, brotherly sisterly relationship with each other. And uh, most of the comic is just about the Titans going, "Hey, Raven, this guy." He, he doesn't quite feel right. You should be careful of him. And she just goes off the deep end, which happens a lot in comics. You know, now that I mentioned Hawk, uh, Hank Hall on that previous issue, uh, it just seems to be an, uh, a really easy way to get the characters to have conflict with each other. I guess I, I think of it as a crutch, but you know, it, it's it's a, it's a common thing. Uh, next up. For you Trekkies out there, and yes, I said Trekkies, not Trekkers. If you're a Trekker, you're just being um, uh, pretentious. Um, there you go. <laughs> Let the hate mail commence. Um, let's see. So this is the Star Trek series that DC came out with after Star Trek V. This is by Peter David. Um, Peter David, uh, James Fry as the penciler and stars inker. Uh, I really enjoyed this run, uh, for the most part, especially the, the first year or so of it. They had an interesting, they had this one character who was, would become, she's kind of like the, what what they call her? I'm trying to remember now from back in 1990. Um, uh, protocol officer, I think, is what she was. So she was always dogging Kirk and, and reminding him of, of everything that he, you know, shouldn't be doing and what he should be doing. And it turns out, uh, in the end, she kind of falls in love with him. It's Kirk, right? Um, so uh, she ends up basically leaving the comic after so long. But anyway, uh, because of the stuff that happened in Star Trek V, Kirk is a wanted man. And so the, the guy you see on the cover blasting the phaser out of Kirk's hand, which, you know, that's nice that he doesn't vaporize Kirk's hand, right? But anyway, that's comics. Uh, uh, he's a bounty hunter uh, named Mr. Sweeney. And uh, he, you know, he, he comes across as British, and he's very proper, and not very, uh, not doesn't doesn't fit the the bounty hunter stereo bounty hunter stereotype. Um, he he plays chess with Spock, and then when he loses, he vaporizes the whole chess set, and then says, "Have another go at it," you know. He's, and they do this several times. So you see a later panel in here where they the, the there are burn marks, like four or five burn marks on the table. Uh, anyway. Uh, Kirk and company end up getting away from from Sweeney, uh, you know, but it's a nice little. Mostly, I liked what I liked about this is Peter David's um, humor that he throws in there, which kind of fits with Star Trek V. Uh, if, if you remember that film, uh, William Shatner directed that. Um, this is the one where they introduced Cybok, uh, which was not Gene Roddenberry's. Um, it was not blessed by Gene Roddenberry. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Uh, and, and Star Trek V is considered by most fans of, of the franchise to not be one of the better films, and I happen to agree with that. But I also recognize, you know, what they were trying to do with it. Uh, so I don't, I don't think it's that bad, but you know, then again, I'm a Trekkie. So there you go. That's, that's Star Trek number eight. And then here we go. Animal Man 23. Oh, my gosh. Like the Legion... Uh, series that I just talked about. This Animal Man run by Grant Morrison. 
Let's see, this is by Grant Morrison. I just realized I did not say who did the Titans. That's Wolfman, Perez, Grummet, and Vey did the hats. So there you go. Sorry about that. Uh, but this uh, Animal Man issue is by, of course, Morrison. Gosh, who's the... There we go. There's the page that has the credits. Uh, Chaz Truog, Trug. I wish I knew how to pronounce these. Doug Hazelwood on, are the artists. Um, this is... Uh, what a great run. This... more. I love Morrison. Uh, I don't think I've read anything by Morrison that I haven't liked to some degree. I mean, he, some stories are better than others. Um, this is definitely one of them. Uh, this whole thing, this is where Animal Man is, he's kind of unstuck. He, it reminds me of, gosh, what was that? Uh, I can't remember the story now. I, never mind. Just forget that. <laughs> I was going to refer to a, uh, a great story by one of our literary giants, but uh, it's not coming to me, and this is video, so I'm not stopping it. Um, okay, anyway, so he's kind of, uh, Animal Man's unstuck in time, and and he meets up with the Phantom Stranger, and let's see, Immortal Man, and Jason Blood, and they just have this conversation, this is, oh gosh, I don't know what, what time frame this is, but it's, it's 60s? I think it's 60s, some, somewhere in the 60s. I thought I'd knew what it was, now that I don't. Um, but what's really cool about this is, so we have this discussion, you know, he's having this existential um, uh, thing going on. But the other story that's going on here is that the Psycho Pirate is having an, an existential moment himself because, you know, the Psycho Pirate, at the end of Crisis on Infinite Earths, he still kind of had he still knew of the of the multiverse, if I remember correctly. And if he didn't, if I'm if I'm not remembering this correctly, Morrison made him remember it in the pages of Animal Man. And so we get a little bit more of that, where he can see these characters that have been written out of continuity. And that's what this is. This is this is a meta story. This is um, this is this is a story about stories. This is a story about superhero comics in the sense of there are characters that that the writers and the fans um, play with and then they get tossed out, right? Kind of like what happened with the New 52 in DC with, with like Donna Troy and Wally West and you know others, Stephanie Brown. And, um, you know, they're just, they're, they're here one day, they're great, and then they've lived out their usefulness and they're gone. Um, and so you see the, 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 the members of the crime syndicate, um, Ultraman, Power Ring, uh, Johnny Quick, and, and, and a bunch of other characters, too, that show up um, throughout this, this title. And uh, you get uh, Binky, uh, which is, um, you know, the, the, some of the characters on the front cover here. Just, just stuff from um, other eras of DC Comics, which I thought was a really nice touch. And, and, it's, and it's not just those, you know, throughout all this, it's people in the background you, you can recognize. I'm not going to go through those, but... Um, and characters that Morrison just, just made up just for this, and, and we get that a little bit at the end, because we get, um, what is it, the, uh, where is it, oh, I gotta, I gotta show you that, this is exciting, isn't it, <laughs> uh, oh yeah, this is great, Overman, um, so there's, there's this alternate world. I, I'm pretty sure this is new in this comic. It's not something that we've seen before. I, I could be wrong. Um, Noy Morrison, he, there was probably some one-off panel in some comic in 1972 or something that had these, these characters. But uh, so Overman is this on this parallel Earth where you know he's the Superman that goes crazy and kills off all of his contemporaries. Um, and he ends up, he's, he's, he's got a doomsday bomb, he's going to destroy his world, and then he, and because of uh, Psycho Pirate's abilities, or the, the lack of control of his abilities, um, he brings that uh, crazy-ass superhero into, you know, quote-unquote, our world, and then um, Animal Man's got to stop him <clears throat> in the next issue. But this is... I wanted to point this out. This is really cool. This is one of those times uh, that Morrison's playing around with story and uh, breaking. You, you, you may have heard the the uh, expression "breaking the fourth wall" in theater and uh, television. You know where you don't you don't break that fourth wall. Um, 
uh, you don't acknowledge the the existence of the audience. Um, and but here Morrison does, and then so here's this. Uh, Psycho Pirates has all these characters that he has conjured or has allowed to, to come into existence in some way, and uh, they're all gathered here. And he keeps talking, you know, um, uh, you know. There's one. There's one panel here at the bottom, right there. See that? And so you know, he's like, "There, you see them leering down, referring to us, you know, enjoying our pain." This cage we're in, they keep us here and make us turn tricks for their cheap amusement. Have you seen it before? Look! And then you get this nice, whoa, there we go, where Ultraman is, he sees a wall and he's pushing on it, pushing on it, and he breaks through the panel. <laughs> I love this stuff. This, this was such a cool comic. Yeah, just, oh, just great stuff makes me want to go back and read that whole run again. So that was Animal Man 23. Um, the good Animal Man, not the Animal Man that's being published now. I know. I know. A lot of people out there that love the new Animal Man. I don't. Okay. Uh, finally, Legion 90, number 15. Uh, this was... So this was by Alan Grant. Gosh, see, I should prepare better for these things. I know. You don't want to look at my forehead all the time, looking down, I know, but... Oh, gosh, where's that? No, oh, it's right there on page one. What a doof. Okay, uh, Alan Grant. Oh, and Barry Kitson. My good friend Barry Kitson. Um, <laughs> I'm being facetious there. Uh, Alan Grant, Barry Kitson, uh, co-plotting, um, and Barry Kitson doing pencils with uh, Mark McKenna doing inks. I really enjoyed this Legion run, especially with Barry Kitson doing the art. Um, let's see, this is when um, Garen Beck, right? Is that right? Yeah. Garen Beck, oh, it says on the cover, Garen Beck, right? Um, the Emerald Eye from the Legion of Superheroes, the I guess the 20th century version of the Emerald Eye, um, bonds with Garen and he kind of goes drunk with power, gets drunk with power. Uh, and so they have to deal with that. I just, flipping through this, it reminded me how how good this was, and, and I really like Docs and uh, uh, what was uh, Stealth is in here, who who just recently in a, a different incarnation has shown up in Threshold uh, that Keith Giffen is writing, uh, and you have the ancestor of Shadowlass in here, and also an ancestor of Block from the Legion of Superheroes. I I just love this. Oh, and then and then uh, there is Phase, who was. A Phantom Girl who disappeared in the Legion of Superheroes comic, uh, which was a, a nice tie-in to that. But uh, mostly it was just that that Garen, you know, it's it's, it's a comedy of sorts. Uh, you know, Garen doing his his best to be an ass, more than more than usual, actually, as I recall correctly. Um, but there you go. That's it. That, that's all the comics I want to talk about. I, the final thing I want to mention uh, as I was preparing this and looking at the comics. Um, I noticed that the majority of these, all except two, right, one, two, yeah, all except two of those, um, let's see, I'll look over here so I'm not looking over there, um, they came, they started in 1989, so everything but New Titans and Daredevil, Daredevil of course, um, started in 19, I thought that was, I thought that was just a really interesting coincidence, uh, the comics that I'm, that I was reading, March 1990, when I was 21, and it was a very good year, um, <laughs> uh, came out in 1989, so that was, that was interesting. Oh, no, th there were three, sorry. Animal Man came out in 88, as well as New Titans, so can't read my own handwriting. Uh, there you go, that's it. Uh, I thought that was uh, just an interesting thing to, to take a look at. Comics when I was 21, March 1990. What were you reading back then? W were you reading comics back then? Um, love to hear what you have to say about that, what, uh, what you were reading, uh, uh, or what, even what you were doing in March 1990. All right, that's it. I'm out of here. Bye-bye.